1 Samuel, this week we're coming to the end of 1 Samuel, when we look at 1 Samuel, what God says to Samuel is, I look at the heart. So I have good news for you and bad news. The good news is that God knows your heart. And the bad news is God knows your heart. And so you can do something and everybody think they've got the wrong motive and yet your motive was right and God knows your heart. And the bad news is you can do something and pretend to the person, oh, pastor, that was the best sermon ever. And then get in the car and go, was that not the worst thing you've ever heard? And the good news is that God knows your heart, but the bad news is also that God knows your heart. And so today we're kind of finishing up this series. So if this is your first week, the good news is you can say, I got nine weeks of, or 11 weeks of sermons in one week. And you can pretty much pretend. And so when your spiritual heart is not right, it can make you selfish. It can make you angry. It can make you anxious. It can make you frustrated. It can mess up relationships when your spiritual heart is not right. And so today we're going to talk about the importance of listening and obedience, surrender, and letting God set your values. So here's the three big lessons from First Samuel. Number one, be prepared to obey God's voice. Now you remember from the very first week, Samuel's mom came and dedicated him to the Lord. And here's what it says in First Samuel 3, 10 and 11. The Lord came and stood there calling, as other times, he's calling Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, because Eli told him, next time you hear that voice, it's not me, ask. So Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Listen, the first thing I want to encourage you to do. If you want to have a heart after God, you have to take time to listen to God. You have to take time to spend time in his word. You have to take time saying to God, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? When we say no to God and we refuse to listen to God and we just do whatever we want and pursue the things we want, and then we wonder, why do I... Why is my life so out of balance? Why am I struggling with so many areas of my life? Well, it could just be that you've told God, be quiet, leave me alone. And by the way, when we tell God to leave us alone, you know what he says? Okay. John 14, 23, Jesus said this, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them, and listen to this, and make our home with them. If you're a Christian today, even if you feel far from God, Jesus promises, I will never leave you. You might be going through the worst time of your life right now. You, you might, like I talked about last week, you might be going through such a struggle, such a difficulty. And if you are, I would encourage you to listen to last week's sermon, by the way. I give some practical things to help you. He was just waiting for me to get quiet. Is that what happened over there? (laughs) So here's the first question for us. (laughs) He's been, hey, he was listening to me nine months before he was born. What do you want? All right. Are you being obedient to God's word? Because we tend to want to do whatever we want to do and then tell God, but bless me anyway. And the truth is, if we're not following God, if we're not listening to God, if we're pursuing whatever we want, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, if we are pursuing those things and then we wonder why we're struggling with joy and peace, any time that you try to do things for selfish and and self-centered reasons, that you're a believer, (laughs) uh, one of the first things that leaves is peace. Number two. Exactly. Surrender your compulsion, your sin. And let me tell you what sin is like. I remember the first summer I moved from Miami to the big city of Titusville. (laughs) By the way, anytime somebody says Titusville now, I instantly say the big city. Just, it's sarcastic if you didn't know that. Okay. So anyway, um, so moved to Titusville. And I remember one of the first things that happened is we were driving down the river on River Road. And I said, what is that smell? 
and I got the most political answer I've ever gotten. And if you've been to Titusville and said those words, everybody says the same thing, and I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, it's an absolute lie. But here's what they'll say. You say, man, it stinks like sewage, and they will say, it's not the sewage, it's the seaweed. To which I say, so you're telling me they've never dumped sewage in there? Oh, no. No, they dumped sewage in there for years and years and years. But that's not why it stinks. <laughs> so you're telling me, the man who grew up in Miami, who was near the water all the time, that I smell sewage, not seaweed. But what I'm smelling is seaweed. That's right. It's not the sewage. So you're telling me that years of dumping sewage in there did not make the seaweed stink like I'm not. That's right. Who told you that? Our politicians. Okay. Now, here's what's really funny. So last night I told this story. Ernie, heard, you heard me tell it before you took a nap. But okay, so you heard me tell it. And then I, okay. He has to listen to me twice, so he might as well get some sleep sometime. All right, so, so here's the deal. So last night, I told the story about this, and I thought, I wonder if that still happens. So I Googled, I Googled Titusville, sewage. Literally, first article was like three days ago. Titusville dumps more sewage accidentally in the river. I feel like that guy from Austin Powers, accidentally. And they're just dumping sewage accidentally more and more in the river. Do you ever wonder why you go to Melbourne and the river doesn't stink, but you go up north and it stinks? Ah, it must need more drainage. That's what it is. That's what your politicians will tell you. That's what it needs. Yeah, how about we quit dumping sewage in it? Now, how in the world does this become spiritual? It doesn't. I just wanted to vent about the sewage in Titusville. <laughs> no, here's the truth. If you expect to have a pure heart before God, but you allow everything the world wants to dump in you. You read whatever and watch whatever and allow whatever to fill your life with sewage. And you, listen, I don't have to give you a definition, do I? I don't have to tell you what the number one shows are, or the number one internet sites are. And we wonder why we struggle we wonder why we struggle with selfishness and self-centeredness, and yet the very things that we watch and the very things that we let fill our minds and our hearts are just pouring sewage. And we like to say, yeah, but that's not why I'm this way. That's not why it smells like sewage. It's that other thing. No. Be careful what you allow to pour into you. Why? Because when you have compulsion, when you have sin, and when you have former sin habits, some of you became Christians and had former, if you get around those things, you're going to have a tendency to that selfish gravity and go right back where you were. And if you think you're the only one, let's look 3,000 years ago, more or less, and look at what happened to Saul as he was supposed to wait for Samuel. Wait till dark. I'll be there before dark on that day. So here's what happens. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. And just like sin, just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel. By the way, this wasn't the only time Saul did something like this. Saul replied, listen to what Saul does. By the way, David, when he sinned and when he messed up, said... Have mercy on me, God. It's me. Saul, when he messed up, listen to what he does. He's like that boss that you had. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering, so he's blaming the men, and then he says, and that you didn't come, which is never a good thing to do. When I saw the men were scattering and you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling... At Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come against me at Gilgal, and I've not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt, what's the next word? Compelled. Compelled to offer the burnt offering. 
One of the things that the enemy does with sin is he makes us compulsive. He makes us feel that pull towards sin, that pull towards doing what's wrong, that pull for saying that thing that you shouldn't have said. You know, the thing that crossed your mind and you thought, I probably shouldn't say that, and then you felt compelled. I'm just a person that speaks my mind. Yeah, you know what we call that? A jerk, right? <laughs> Listen to what it says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. If you, By the way, if you struggle with anxiety, this is a great verse for you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, what does he say? Present your request to God. And what will happen? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Next time you feel anxious, say to God, God, would you help me walk through this? By the way, sometimes part of it's recognizing why you're anxious. What are you really anxious about? Sometimes when you're around a person, you're responding to them, but the truth is they're not the problem. You're maybe fighting a battle in your mind with somebody else or something else, or maybe you haven't forgiven somebody or you're dealing with something. And so you take that anxiety out on them. Deal with it and say, God, would you help me to rest in you? Second encouragement to you is to receive his peace in prayer. And some of you, your prayer today needs to be, God, I need your peace. Would you show me what's going on with my heart? Would you show me what's happening? Number three, you are not what others see. One of the things I talked about a few weeks ago is I have to believe people when they tell me something. So when I say to somebody in church, uh, uh, why are you quitting? Are you mad? And they go, I'm not mad. And they say it to me that way, by the way. I'm not mad. I have to believe them because I'm not a mind reader. But the truth is that God knows their heart. And even if you say something outside, by the way, I don't know why your teacher said not what she appears we actually know the truth. You're more wonderful. Is that what I was supposed to say? Is that I say? No, you really are wonderful. So here's the truth. When I was a kid, I was not athletic. I know that's a shocker to some of you because I'm so tall. And when I was in high school, I was about 5'2". So I've actually grown since high school, which is crazy. So I was teeny tiny, but there was, so I didn't like P.E., I, I, I didn't enjoy P.E. Lunch was my favorite. And so, and band, of course. So, but there was one day a year that I loved P.E. And it's when the coach would say, today we're doing long jump. Now, I know that you don't know this about me because I've never told this story, but I remembered it the other day, and I remember how awesome it was when the coach said, hey, today is long jump, because here's the deal. Even though I'm three feet tall, I could out jump everyone in the school. Everyone in the school. I have no idea why. I have no idea how. But I'm talking like a foot farther broad jump than anybody else. And so I remember we did the test. Everybody lined up and everybody would go do, 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 do. And then I would jump and literally could hear, ooh. Which was awesome when you're not athletic. It's like, yeah, hey. So I can't run fast. So I can't do this. I, by the way, I was fast too. But, uh, but so all those things. Do you remember? Do you remember broad? Did you guys? You, the girls didn't have to do broad jump, did you? Oh, coach with coach. Okay. So Laura went to my school, high school. So I was just sorry. Sorry. You just, you just happened to be here. We're talking. Um, so I'll never forget. I went back to my 10 year reunion and one of the kids, one of the other students actually said to me, hey, I remember how good you were at broad jump. And I got to tell you, it was like, yeah, I know. What a dumb thing to be prideful about. But here's the truth. If you looked at me in high school and you picked out of all the students and said, who's going to go jump the farthest? You would have never picked me. You would have picked everybody else and then said, yeah, Eric will come in like 15th out of 16. Right? The truth about you is you don't even always know who you are. 
You don't always even know the gifts God's given you and how you bless people and the way you make people feel and the encouragement that you give to people and you don't even know it. You may feel like you're a loser. You may feel like you don't matter. Somebody may have even told you all those things, but that's not what God sees. Listen to what it says. David's beginning right here. Eventually, he's going to be considered the line of Jesus, but his own dad doesn't even invite him to be anointed as king. Here it is. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height. By the way, if you're short, that should be your favorite verse in the Bible. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Listen. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God knows you better than you know you. And some of you carry a lot of baggage from things that people have said to you. Some of you carry a lot of baggage because of trauma that happened to you when you were young. Some of you carry a lot of baggage and you still say things about yourself that God does not say about you. Don't believe the lies about you, about who you are. I'm sure as David stood out in that field by himself with all his brothers going to the possible kingship ceremony that he thought, I am the loser in this family. And yet, when you read the Bible, David is talked about more than any other king. Jesus, the Messiah, is in the line of David, born in the town of Bethlehem, the city of David. When I die, nobody's going to go to Titusville and say, Titusville, the city of Eric. <laughs> no one, right? David, city of David. That's the guy who nobody had any respect for. And maybe, just maybe, God has a plan for you that you don't even trust in right now. Believe what God says about you, not what you say about you. Listen to this. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip down a few verses on this one because you know the story of David and Goliath. And David, in verse 45, says, You come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Goliath looked at David and said, you are nothing. Why are you even here? You're just a stick. And David said, you come to me with all these things and might, but I come to you in God's name. Hey, the Bible says I can do all things who, through Christ who strengthens me. What difficulty are you dealing with right now that you think you're going to handle yourself? Every once in a while, somebody will say to you, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle. Can I tell you the truth? God doesn't give you anything you can't handle, wait, 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 without his help. But without his help, yeah, you'll fail and falter and fall. So maybe the best prayer for you today is, God, I just need your help. God, I'm selfish and self-centered in my own will. I need the power of your spirit. To think outside of me, to think outside of my selfishness and my self-centeredness and the way I think life should be. God, would you help me? God, would you give me wisdom to make wise decisions? Sometimes our wise decisions are about who to be around and what to watch and what to spend our time with online. If you spend all your time watching news, can I tell you you're going to become fearful and angry? Why? Because you're just allowing fear and anger to pour into your mind all the time. And then you wonder, well, I don't know why it smells like sewage around here. Must be the seaweed. Sorry, I had to go back to Titusville. There we go. Ephesians 1, 3. All the people in Titusville are going to be mad at me today. Google sewage Titusville later just for fun. All right. Accident. All right, sorry. Ephesians 1.3 says this, and I want you, if you don't remember anything else about this sermon, and if your spouse is asleep and you wake them up, here's the time. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So here's your final admonition. Let God set your value. Do you realize all that God has done for you? I want to read you a story. I told it last night, but I think I can read it better. It's a Paul Harvey story, but it's a true story. 
It's gratitude that, prom- that prompted an old man to visit an old broken pier on the eastern seacoast of Florida. Every Friday night until his death in 1973, he would return walking slowly and slightly stooped with a large bucket of shrimp. Seagulls would flock to this old man and he would feed them from his bucket. Many years before, in October of 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission in a B-17 to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. But there was an unexpected detour and they became the most harrowing adventure of his life. Somewhere over the South Pacific, the flying fortress became lost beyond the reach of radio. Fuel ran low, so the men ditched their plane in the ocean. For nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions would fight the water, the weather, and the scorching sun. They spent many sleepless nights recoiling as a giant shark would ram their rafts. The largest raft was nine by five. The biggest shark was ten feet long. But all of their enemies at sea, one proved the most formidable, starvation. Eight days out, their rations were long gone or destroyed by the salt water. It would take a miracle to sustain them. And a miracle occurred. In Captain Eddie's own words, Cherry was the B-17 pilot. Captain William Cherry read the service that afternoon and finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. With a hat pulled down over his eyes to keep out some of the glare, it says he dozed off. Now this is what Captain Eddie Rickenbacker said. Something landed on my head. I knew that it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. Everyone else knew too. No one said a word, but peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at that goal. That goal meant food, if I could catch it. And the rest is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull, its flesh was eaten, its intestines were used for bait to catch fish, and the survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because of a long-lost seagull. Uncharacteristically, hundreds of miles from land, it offered itself as a sacrifice. You know that Captain Eddie made it, and now you also know that he never forgot because every Friday evening about sunset on a lonely stretch along the eastern Florida seacoast, you could see an old man walking, white-haired, bushy-eyed, slightly bent, bucket filled with shrimp to feed the gulls to remember that one that on long pass gave itself without struggle like manna in the wilderness. Just like he remembered what the goals had done for him, can I tell you how to really have a heart change? Remember what God has done for you. Remember the hope that you have in the cross. Remember the hope that you have that no matter how much you're messed up and broken, that he came to forgive your sins. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him, knowing that Jesus died on a cross and rose again to forgive our sins because we're all messed up, we're all broken. I've never had to convince anyone of that. But the truth is we need a savior. So if you want to give your life to Christ, I'll be here after the service and you can come and say, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, you're struggling. Maybe you're struggling with discouragement. Maybe you're struggling with wisdom. Maybe you're struggling because... You're just knowing that your heart has been far from God. Today's a day to make a new commitment, and you can do that. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word. May we, every day, remember what you've done for us, and may it change us. Lord, just like Mr. Rickenbacker gave shrimp to the birds, I pray that we would surrender our hearts to you, knowing what you've done for us. Lord, thank you for that. Father, I pray for that one who's discouraged today. I pray they would know that no matter what comes next, that you're going to walk them through, that you're going to give them your strength. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.